Hello and welcome. Thank you. What the fuck? We'll just restart that. Here we go. Hello and welcome to Threes a Crime, a true crime podcast. I'm Tori. I'm Emily. And I'm Lindsay. And that's our intro. Here we are. We are professional. Professional podcasters. We're podcasters, bitches. Hi guys. Hi. 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 I am currently in New Orleans when this episode comes out. Yeah. So jealous. We're we're very, really, really jealous. jealous. But I am. Easy baby. But I am excited for after you return. We're gonna have kind of like a New Orleans theme. So you'll have the story of the Axeman coming up. Which I'm gonna cover, which I think is gonna be a mini because it's not very it's not long. a long story. I mean, he killed a lot of people, but it's not necessarily a long story because there's not a lot of details. And then um Emily, are you doing Madame Lalaurie? As yeah, I planned on it. And I'm gonna do the vampire brothers. Vampire brothers. It's not gonna be Twilight, like. So today we're gonna be talking about the dating game killer which is really just such a small part of a whole horrible story um, about the serial killer, Rodney Alcala. Is there an episode about it on 2020? I think that's where I saw it. Yes, there is an episode um, where actually um, I got a fair amount of information. Um, I did a lot of research and I had the whole story put together. Um, but the one thing the 2020 episode did, and it is epi- it is season 43, so I think the <laughs> current season on... Season 950? Yeah. yeah, seriously. <laughs> season 43, episode 9, and it is available on Hulu. Um, the nice thing about that episode is it really went into more detail about the victims, which I was having a hard time finding more than just... Like, they actually did with interviews and stuff with people who knew them, which is what is important to me, because they're not just like, this person was found bludgeoned. They're not just getting information from a Wikipedia page. Right. So, um, so yeah. So, uh, I will kind of um, mention when we have trigger warnings, but there's a lot of rape, a lot of murder, and children. So... Rodney James Alcala was actually born Rodrigo Jacques Alcala Bucor on August 23rd, 1943, in San Antonio, Texas, to Mexican-American parents. In 1951, when Alcala was about seven, his father moved the entire family to Mexico and then abandoned the family three years later. Okay. Yeah. So in 1954... His mother moved Rodney, and he also had um, an older brother and sister um, back to the U.S. um, and settled in Los Angeles in the Monterey Park area. He was enrolled in private Catholic schools, and he grew up having every advantage. And I think that this is really important because a lot of the stories that we cover, you know, these people have had, like, the Night Stalker, who we haven't covered yet, but, like, he had a totally Rough, traumatic sad, abusive but, childhood yeah. and head injury and the whole deal alcala had none of this he was raised by a mother that loved him he had siblings that 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 all grew up and became successful people productive members of society yeah exactly um and as a child he was described as kind respectful highly intelligent um his older brother uh 
had gone to West Point. They were considered to be a patriotic family. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, he really grew up with every advantage. In 1961, when he was 17, he joined the Army. But he struggled in the military. He went AWOL a few times. He kind of kept getting in trouble. And then in 1964, he went AWOL again, hitchhiking from Fort Bragg in North Carolina to his mother's house in Monterey Park in California. Oh, my. That's hard. Yeah. Lord. So the Army had him meet with a military psychiatrist, and the Army's line was that he suffered a mental breakdown. However, the military psychiatrist was like, uh, I think it's a little bit more than that. Like, he was having, like, some really serious, dark things, thoughts, and whatnot. Um, and he was diagnosed with what is now known as antisocial personality disorder. And we have talked about, we've talked that, but, 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 we've talked about that before, where antisocial personality disorder, it just sounds like, oh, I'm antisocial. I don't like other people. <laughs> um, but anti- antisocial means like you behavior, hate society, right? Yeah, is yeah. like, yeah. yeah, that's like the, the, this person's going to be a serial killer. Um, yeah. You know, moniker. Anyway. So the army had deemed that it was a mental breakdown. The military psychiatrist was like, ooh, this dude's no good. Um, but they went ahead and discharged him for medical reasons, which means he received an honorable discharge <sighs> with no blemish on his record. Of course. So once he was released from the army, Alcala went back to Pe- uh, went back to Pennsylvania. He did not go back to Pennsylvania. He went to California and enrolled in the UCLA School of Fine Arts. Okay. This is trigger warning number one, child, rape, the whole thing. Are there any animals in this one? No. Not that kids are better. No, (laughs) no, no. Yeah. I'm just asking like ahead of time. Yes. Prepare myself. No, no, no. Okay. So in 1968, an eyewitness called police after noticing a man lure a young child into his apartment. Nope. The girl was eight, eight year old, Tally Shapiro. Tally and her family, so her father was, like, a big music producer, and then she had her mom, and then um, I think she had she had an older brother and sister. Um, they had been staying at, the like, this famous hotel, the Chateau Marmont, mm-hmm. um, in, in L.A., yeah. um, because their home had had a fire, and so they were not living. not to stay at the Cecil that time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they were staying at... The that Chateau place Marmont. was like the fucking place back then. Yeah, it, like super. Everybody was there. Yeah, super fancy hotel. What's it called? The Chateau Marmont. Marmont. Like yes. poets and like Johnny Depp lived there for like like it's a bunch oh of... it's like a whole thing yeah. yeah. Um. So Tally later said that the man approached her and he said he had like a cool poster or painting or something that he wanted to show her, and he asked her if she wanted to ride to school. Oh my god! And what she was like. This? 1968. Oh, oh. So, yeah. um, you know, Tali told him, like, hey, I'm not allowed to talk to strangers. And he's like, oh, I'm not a stranger. I know your parents. I'm oh. friends with your parents. Oh, no. Don't ever trust it. And so she was just, she didn't want to get into the car, but she's like, well, I've been taught to respect my elders. Ugh. So she gets in the car. And she'd said, like, she immediately was wanted to, like, just jump out of the car. She, like, knew she had made a mistake. The man asked her what time she had to be at school, and when she told him, he was like, oh, well, we have we have time to go to my apartment first, and I can show you this picture. And, yeah, so the man that had seen him, like, drive up to her and her get in the car, like, knew that something sketch was going on, so he actually followed the car. Good. Wow. And then when he saw the man take the girl into the apartment, he called police. I just want to say to anybody who has young children out there, this is the advice I just told my friend Kira. If your kids are ever like, like her kid just started asking about walking to school by herself and Kira's really nervous about it because obviously because, people yeah. fucking take kids. Mm-hmm. Child trafficking is a big problem in Spokane. It is. I was going to say Actually, Washington like, is Washington's, so bad. Washington is really bad. And like the yeah. Shadle Walmart that is right by me, there have been multiple cases of kids yeah. like yeah. either being stolen or almost being stolen. I told her to tell her kids like I will never, ever ever send somebody that you do not know to pick you up. I don't care 
if they know your fucking social security number and the second you were born, like if you don't know them, I will right. never send them. Yes. And so to your point, when I was growing up, my parents, because this ruse of saying like, oh, I know your parents, I'm their friend, they they all use that. So we had a safe word, mm. my parents did. And they said, if we ever send anybody to pick you up, this is what they'll say. Or what was your safe word? What was your safe word? Clowny the happy, which was a clown. Excuse that me, what? Yeah. Clown? So my my grandmother had made me this clown. It's the only clown in my life that I've never been like terrified of. But I think it's because my grandmother made it. I named it Clowny the Happy. And so that was. That truly sounds like it could be from a horror movie. Right. It does. Clowny the Happy. Clowny the Happy. Don't respect your elders if they're trying to put you in their fucking car. Right. Yeah. If an elder it. puts you in your car, you fucking scream. Yeah. Fuck I've being always. polite. Listen to your gut. Yeah. Exactly. What, what, state, oh my God, what's the, my favorite murder? Stay sexy, don't get murdered. No, it's murder. not that one. It's, uh. Call your dad. What was the, what did you just say? What was the sentence? Stay sexy, don't get murdered. Yeah, stay sexy, don't get murdered. What um, was, you just said another one. It's about being polite or something. Fuck being polite. Oh, it's from Crime Junkie. Oh. Be, Oh, be rude, stay alive. That's yeah. what theirs is. Is like, and I mean that that goes to women too. Because no, we're absolutely. so we're so ingrained that we're supposed to be polite. Anyway, okay. So, Clowny the happy. Clowny, Clowny the, happy. the happy. Okay. So the witness has called the police, and the police are on their way. When police arrive and knock on the door, it takes a minute, and then Alcala comes to the window. Now he's wearing no clothes, no towels, no. and he's not wet. But he yells out through the window that he was in the shower and he needs a minute to put on his pants and then he'll open the door. The officer informs him, uh, you got seconds to open this door, motherfucker. Yeah, you know? seriously. Um, I don't give a fuck about like, your pants. Exactly. Yeah. And he was like, you have seconds to open this door or we're going to break it down. And that's exactly what they ended up doing was mm. breaking down the door. Good. Um, Good when they job, walk this in, guy that called. Yeah. yeah. Followed. <laughs> fuck. Yeah. Like, that man literally... Deserves all the awards. Yeah. yeah. Seriously. Um, so, when the police open the door and walk into the apartment, what they find is a very gruesome scene of blood and little kids' clothing, like her little white Mary Janes. And, oh. Yeah. Um, and they, in what appears to be a deceased child, covered in blood with a steel bar across her neck. So... They kind of go through the apartment. They're sort of like looking for him. She's lying. And um, one of the detectives, and he actually got really teary eyed when he said this. Um, he just, he was like, he went back to Tally because he couldn't leave her like that. And when he did, he heard her like gaggle gagging, or something, gurgling, gaggling, yeah, gaggling, gaggling, gagging like on blood. And he was like, oh, my God, like, holy shit, she's alive. And so he's, like, yelling, like, oh, my God. You Why know? didn't anybody check that? Well, because she just, like, when, I mean, this is all happening in a matter of, like. <sighs> Seconds. Yeah. I mean, they just, they walk in, they see the scene. She appears dead. They're like, okay, where's our suspect? Anyway, when he started yelling, the officer that had gone to the back of the apartment thought he, thought the officer inside was calling for help. So he runs back to the front of the apartment and Akala used this to escape out the back. Oh. So they had a decision to make. Either they would try stay to stay with the Tali girl or, or go, they're after, go after, him. after him. And they chose Tali. You know, luckily an ambulance was already on the way. So they put Tali in the ambulance. Officers began searching the apartment and they find Alcala's student ID from UCLA. They also found... A ton of photos of young men and women, <gasps> boys and girls in various stages of dress and vulnerability. Ew. Meanwhile, at the hospital, the doctors initially told her parents that Tali had no chance of survival. Um, however, she's a bad bitch. She's a bad bitch. She was in a coma for 32 days. Jeez. And she required months of rehab once she'd woken up just to get like. Even yeah. like talk. Do- Doing all the things that you can that yeah that she's you were able to do as an eight year old. Eight. eight. I was gonna say fifteen. No, no. she was eight years old. <sighs> Mistaking her for Mary Vincent. Yes. Holy fuck. So Oof. the Shapiros, Tolly has said because they you know she gets interviewed as an adult that she has no recollection of going up to the apartment. She has no recollection Good. of what happened there. Thank. I mean, I think that's 
probably a blessing. Yeah. But at the same time, like there was no discussion of it in her household. Like it was oh, never that's discussed. that's super dangerous. Never brought yeah. up. She said like, you know, she would go to school and she felt like everybody was looking at her like, you're supposed to be dead. But it was never, it was never discussed. Nobody ever said um, anything. And then the Shapiros were like, fuck this. We are out of here. We want a safer place for our children to grow up. So they actually relocated um, to Mexico shortly after Tali's recovery, which I find really funny that back in the 70s, Mexico was a safer place to raise your children, <laughs> yeah. you know, than L.A., yeah. which yeah. I don't know that now it would be the same. But uh-uh. Lindsay, this is for you. <gasps> oh, a little side trivia here. The detective that was eventually assigned to Tali's case was one Steve Hodell. Who is that? Steve Hodell, if you've listened to my favorite podcast, Root of Evil, you will know who Steve Hodell is. Holy shit. Because he was with the LA Police Department. Oh, Oh I need to listen to that podcast. Um, If you don't know who Steve Hodell is and you haven't listened to Root of Evil, um, finish this episode and then go binge the whole thing because it's a doozy. It's one of the most crazy, incredible little sidebar. Um, Steve Hodell is the son of George Hodell, Ooh. who is one of the um, main suspects in the Black Dahlia. Yeah. Oh. He was a wild, fucking crazy motherfucker. Yeah, even if he didn't, like, it, it, so Root of Evil is sort of about the Black Dahlia case. But then it expands to something so much more it's so and so bizarre and so crazy. Um, and the podcast is done by Steve Hodell's nieces. But anyway, Steve Hodell wow. was with the L.A. Police Department, and he is definitely one of the major proponents that his father was the, the Black yeah, Dahlia killer. He, Steve Hodell was a good He's a good, good one. He's a good man. Hodell was assigned to the case about four to five months after Tali's attack. And at this point, Alcala was in the winds. They had no leads, no idea where he'd gone. Hodel thought perhaps Mexico because he had family there. Um, Hodel went out to UCLA and interviewed Alcala's professors, all of whom said, like, you have to have the wrong guy. Like, he's a great guy. He would never hurt a fly. He's so wonderful. Um, they always say. <laughs> yeah. Um, which, you know, okay, that makes, you know, it makes sense because – these psychopaths have this They're very charming. I mean, he he's was considered a very charming man. Yeah. He was able to lure, as we'll see, a lot of women. Um so Okala is now on the run and he he actually fled to New York City. He changed his name to John Berger, not the John Berger Ron Livingston character in Sex in the City, but he, he used that name, John Berger. Aww. And he enrolled in NYU film school where he studied under another rapist, fame director Roman Polanski. I was say Roman Polanski. Um, oh, sad and, for you, Tori. Mm-hmm. <laughs> New York at this time was just like a hotbed yeah, that for was, violence. This is yeah. in you know, the early 70s and it was dirty and it was loud and there was crime. Watch and Taxi Driver and you will get a dose yeah, of Yeah, exactly. That. That's an excellent, yeah. Yeah. Um, so good. So in June of that year, so this is still 1968, I think, um, he struck again. No Cornelia burger. Crilly was a 23-year-old beautiful brunette who had grown up in Queens. She had two brothers and two sisters and was part of a well-respected and well-liked Catholic family. Her dream in life was to be a TWA flight attendant. And it sounds funny now, but, like, it was a super coveted role. I mean, yeah, air, air, fly, like, yeah. air flying? Air, f- <laughs> air, flying. air, air flying, flying was becoming very popular at the time. <laughs> but it was. It it was it As opposed to sea flying. <laughs> It was it was a new thing where you know commercially people could. Well, you got to travel the world. Ex- but, well, exactly. Yeah. They were their title was like ambassadors of the world or something like that. Yeah. So she was really, really wanted to be a TWA flight attendant. Um, and with her big smile, friendly and funny nature, she was nas- naturally selected for this coveted role. At the same time, she had met the love of her life. Like everything was going falling into place. Great. 
for Cornelia. Until it wasn't. Until yep. it wasn't. Fucking um, Rodney Burger. With- Who fucking <laughs> wouldn't at least come up with like a cool name? Right. Yeah. If like you did Jet a fake name Pack or something. I don't know. <laughs> um. I almost said Jet Lee. She she <laughs> with a few of her flight attendant friends um had gotten an apartment altogether on Eighty Third Street, and it didn't seem like a big deal then. Or now, it didn't seem like a big deal now, but it was a big deal then because, and they called this area that she was living like the girls belt or something because it was all of these women in like the early 70s that were, you know, actually I think this was like 1971 when this happened. Um, Yeah, like it was, it was the first time women were able to embrace their careers in a way that they hadn't been able to, to before and have this independence it wasn't like, oh, you have to get married. It was right they... on the cusp of the transition there. Yeah, yeah. like you're just you're transitioning so out of lived like the hippie alone with each other. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. My mom lived with a girl who stole all of her underwear. That's... <laughs> Isn't that gross? That's really weird. I know. Hmm. Um. One day, Cornelia's mother was trying to reach her, and she couldn't get a hold of her, so she had called Cornelia's boyfriend, and he said he would go over to the apartment to check up on her. The building she was living in didn't wasn't like a secure building. Like anybody could get in the initial front door mm. and then the apartments would be locked. See, this is why you get your own dead bull. Right. Yeah. Um when he got there, he knocked on the door, there was no answer, so he called police. So police end up coming in through a back window and then meet him at the front door where he's waiting, and they tell him that Cornelia had been murdered. <sighs> oh. She had been raped. And strangled with a pair of nylons and then had bite marks on her breasts. The police at that time in New York were like, they had 2,000 murders in one year. Wow. Cornelia had just moved to the building, so nobody knew her yet. The police had nothing to go on. Yeah. And her case remained unsolved until 2011. Whoa. Wow. That fucking poor family. Oh. I mean, wait. So in 1971, Alcala had also um, obtained a job as a camp counselor in the summers at a New Hampshire arts camp for kids. No. He changed his last name from Berger, B E R G E R, to Berger. Are you fucking kidding me? No. Um, one star out of ten. Burger <laughs> Bur- like you didn't even try. Yeah. No. Um. Fucking so in August shit. of 1971. Oh, sorry. Let me back up. Earlier that same year, the FBI got interested in the case, and Alcala made the FBI's ten most wanted. Ooh. And I'm sure having an influential father who was like a yeah. big music executive probably helped yeah money <laughs> but, will get you a lot of things money will yeah. get you i mean a lot i didn't things. see that anywhere that's just an assumption on my part right um but anyway um he, because of the attack on tolly he had made the 10 most wanted list then in august of 1971 two of the kids from the camp were walking down a dirt road and it starts to rain so they run into the local post office to get dry and, like, take cover and wait out the storm. And they start looking around and they get to the wall with the FBI wanted posters. And they were like, huh, that, that, looks, like, like that looks like our Mr. Burger. <laughs> so they go back to the camp and they tell the head counselor, like, hey, um, we think we saw Mr. Burger on this wanted poster. And the camp counselor is like, okay. I, like, don't say anything to anybody, and I'll go and check it out. And I'm sure he was probably like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, You seriously. know, then you get there, and you're like, uh, oh, holy crap. The counselor then uh, sees the poster, calls the FBI. They turn in all call, and he's arrested. Was it a picture or a sketch? It was a picture. Oh, so yeah, there was, had, like. I think because I think they had gotten the picture from his student ID. Anyway, so Detective Hodel gets a call from the FBI, and they're like, hey, we got your man out here in New Hampshire. And on August 12th, 1971, Hodel and his partner fly out to New York City and they extradite Alcala back to California. The story could have ended here. But it doesn't. But it does not. If it doesn't, we wouldn't be here. By the time Alcala was captured and returned to California, it would have been three years. 
Um, the Shapiro family had relocated to Mexico and her parents would not allow her to testify at trial. They just feared it would be too, too traumatic for Dolly. But losing their star witness and having her, them be out of the country, prosecutors are left in a bind. Yeah. Initially, Alcala had been charged with kidnapping, rape, child molestation, and torture. But because they were, again, out of state and Tolly wasn't willing to testify, they were only able to charge him with child molestation. <gasps> he was convicted to an indeterminate sentence of one year to life. The issue with a charge like this is that it's sliding and it gives the pa- the parole board the power to de- to decide if and when a person has been rehabilitated or is still a danger to society. He's not getting rehabilitated. And friends. they get no. yearly, yearly parole reviews. Wow. Akala is a master manipulator yeah. who attended therapy and they were like, okay, yeah, we think you're good. So he was paroled after serving only 34 months because of good behavior and for being a quote model prisoner being a monster yeah prisoner am i right well, you are because less than two months after his parole oh, jesus christ alcala assaulted a 13 year old girl of course he did identified oh. in court documents only as julie J. alcala had convinced her to let him give her a ride to school stop and instead he like picked her up took her to like this cliff you know, where yeah. and they were hanging out and smoking weed. And she said that like he forced her to kiss him and then but the but a poor a, a pork ranger. <laughs> oh, a there's pork a Freudian ranger slip. That a is. park ranger caught them. And so um he was convicted um for like supplying a minor drugs and then for marijuana possession. But again, he only served two years before being paroled in 1977. Good God. After his release, his parole officer allowed Alcala, a repeat offender and a flight risk to travel to New York City. Amazing. He goes to his parole officer and he's like, hey, I want to take a vacation to New York. Can I go? And his parole officer like, sure, go ahead. So... This was July of 1977. And July in 1977 in New York was not a good time. Mm-mm. Zero stars. Yeah. Do not recommend. Zero stars. Yelp um, review. Not looking good. Yeah. Garbage wasn't being collected. It was hot. Violent crime dominated the news. <laughs> oh, yeah. Some of the summer. Son of Sam, or oh. Sons of Sam, Sons depending of upon Sam for sure. if you watch that documentary and where you land on that. But Son of Sam was active in killing people. July 13th and 14th was the infamous blackout of New York oh, City, yeah. where the whole city was without power. It was swelteringly hot. They had no water. And people were just generally That's like chaos. Yeah. It yeah. was. It was chaos. Ellen Jane Hover was living in Manhattan at this time. She was a fun-loving girl who made friends easily. Her father was the owner of Ciro's Nightclub, which is a famous Hollywood nightclub, um, where her godfathers, Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr., often appeared. On this, the day of my daughter's wedding. (laughs) Is that the is that the Godfather? Yep. That is the Godfather. I've never seen the Godfather. You You're need, welcome. Um, Proud of you for that. Thank you. So at the same time, Akala is walking the streets asking people to take their pictures. Just being a young pervy. boys and girls, like older men and women, didn't matter to him. He's just ta- asking everybody if he can take their picture. So one day. He meets a beautiful young woman with long brown hair, and he asks her if he can take his take her picture, yeah, and she's she like, ate. "Sure." Um, they start talking; they're getting along, and her friends, Ellen's friends, just described her as being super trusting. I mean, she came from like a Hollywood, you know, legends family. She yeah. was used to being around and meeting lots of people, and like her godfathers are Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin. I mean, she'd God. been around famous people, you know. Sammy Davis Jr. has a character in Big Mouth. In case anyone was wondering, oh. he's a ghost. Ah, oh yeah, and he Jordan sings. Peele. Is it Jordan Peele who yeah. plays him? He does a really good job. Yeah. His- <laughs> <laughs> yes. So 
on July 15th, just the day after the blackout, Ellen went missing. Her mother had called a close friend of hers and asked, like, hey, have you seen Ellen since the weekend? And her friend was like, nope, haven't seen her. By the 11 o'clock news that night, the story of the missing heiress had broken. Upon a search of her apartment, the police saw an entry in her calendar that she was supposed to be meeting a John Berger that day for a photo shoot. Mm, Burger King. So the police try to ID who this John Berger is, but they aren't aware of the Burger Alcala connection. connection. So Ellen's murder, what happened just one week after Alcala, with the approval of his parole officer, had arrived in New York. Amazing. So after the murder, Alcala's like, I gotta get out of New York. He heads back to L.A. It took police in New York five months to dis- to discover the Burger alias, and so they go to interview Alcala. He stated that he had been with her, and he had taken her out to Westchester to take her photo. They had a lovely time, but that was it. Like, he said he vaguely remembered dropping her off, but that was all. They hadn't found Ellen's body at this point, so other than him confessing, they didn't have any reason to hold him. Ellen's body was found 11 months later on the Rockefeller Estates. They had found her clothing in the area, and then her bones were located shortly thereafter. Mm. She had to be identified by dental records because at this point, there it's were there was no body, there was no her. tissue, there were no forensics at all for the authorities to go off of. So during this time in the 70s, there were multiple serial killers active. Yeah. I Hillside Strangler. Mm-hmm. There were two different freeway killers, the Bedroom Basher that Lindsay and I were talking about on the way here, yeah. the Night Stalker, and then Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, and Son of Sam. These are all oh going on, God. overlapping, you know, through the 70s. And the 70s was such like a perfect storm for serial killers to be active because they didn't have the like investigators didn't have any of the tools that they used. Like yeah. there was no DNA. Like there they wasn't like security cameras. And, I yeah. wonder what the what the switch was because there's definitely that's when serial. I mean, they've serial killers have always been around, but right. like the seventies were like holy fucking there's shit. A theory I've heard of why so many serial killers, and it's um, that they grew up with lead paint. Really? And that can cause men- like damage to your brain. Weird. So like, because they started taking away lead paint in like the 70s, 80s. Weird. So the people we also grew don't up- make our houses with asbestos anymore. Yeah, like all these poisons they grew up with. So Teflon. that's like a theory of right. like. Well, I don't know if that is true or not. I don't know. But they it's were all going on and they, and a lot of them were able to kill multiple people with impunity for such a long time because yeah. like we didn't have cctv right. we didn't have security cameras everywhere and as one of the detectives in the 2020 episode said you weren't walking around with like a geolocator in your pocket yeah. at all times yeah so i'll call it is most notable and is most like that's his na- his moniker the dating game killer um because he was a contestant on the popular game show in 1978 which is like downright ballsy but typical for a sociopath oh, right like, he's so at this point smart. he's murdered multiple people he's a felon he's been j- like and i'm like was nobody like doing background Probably checks not. on these but they I, I guess they weren't um and uh as a side note zoe deschanel and michael <laughs> bolton are reviving this game show um and now that i've read the story it totally creeps me the fuck out yeah i not know. be watching yeah i know that's I, true i will not be i want to know who's in this fucking meeting and we're like all right michael bolton and, and zoe, zoe deschanel. deschanel who what? i yeah i, wanna know. I don't i don't know happened. you would think that um he might want to lay low but not our of course not not, not our rodney so um dick. for young listeners who don't know <laughs> The dating game had an eligible bachelorette, sort of like Love is Blind, you know, because it wasn't pods, but yeah, they had an eligible see. bachelorette that is separated from three bachelor contestants by a partition um, who were all vying for a date with a bachelorette. And in the 60s, it was pretty tame, but the, like the producers who are interviewed in the 2020 said, you know, now it's the 70s, they're trying to be edgier and sexier. Yeah, and so 
the bachelorette the would questions ask, are always very like yeah. sexual so, yeah, yeah they would be su- suggestive or provocative questions so for example in that in this episode she had asked like if you were a f- like i'm gonna serve you for dinner if you're a food what would you be and how do you look mm. and he said his reply was they call me the banana and i look good <laughs> and then she was like can you be more specific and he was like peel me Ew. And the audience went wild. <laughs> of course. Um, so the bachelorette would ask a series of questions, and then she would pick one of the bachelors, sight unseen, to go on a date with. And I have to play this for you because this has to be, and they say, like, in hindsight, this is one of the um one of the questions and answers. The whole thing is just like unpleasant. Not okay. No. <laughs> And I'm going to audition each of you for my private class. Bachelor number one. You're a dirty old man. Take it. Come on, over here. What in the fuck? Is that him? Yeah. And so they were like, yeah, here's this guy. That like the audience at the time did he just growl at her? He was like, (sighs) 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 "Come over here!" But it was just really creepy when she was like, "You're a dirty old man." Yeah, and then afterwards, she I I didn't record this part, but she's like does it again, and she's like, "We should go out and boogie." It was really, (laughs) it was really bizarre. So, um, host Jim Lang introduced Alcala as quote. A successful photographer who got his start when his father found him in the dark room at age 13, fully developed. Ew. Ha ha, dad joke. Gross. And then he said, between takes, you might find him skydiving or motorcycling. Now, there was some debate on casting him as a contestant, but not because of his past. The casting director was like, oh, this guy is really handsome and the women are going to love him. And the executive producer said, like, on the sheet, he had put NW, which meant, like, no way. Um, And so they kind of argued back and forth. And he was like, this guy has no personality. He's creepy, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, well, you know, but she, the woman was like, the the women are going to love him. And so they kind of, like, split the baby and um, decided to cast him, but with the caveat that they were going to put two other, like, stronger contestants for the bachelor to choose bachelorette to choose from next to him um jed mills was one of the other bachelors and he was an actor um he described him as a strange guy with bizarre opinions and he claimed that like he was like i didn't like this guy right away and he claimed that upon like entering the green room that alcala was like i always get my girl ew yeah (laughs) so not only did Alcala appear on the show, but he won, meaning that the Bachelorette picked him to go out on a date with. But after the show, like, so immediately after, they talk about the reception of, like, the two of them meeting as kind of being, like, awkward and little, like, meh. Like, she'd been excited to meet him, and then she was kind of, like, Underwhelmed. meh. So, like, the next day, she called and she talked to the casting woman, and she was just, like... I'm getting really weird vibes off this guy. He's super creepy. Like, I I don't want to go on this date. Is that going to be a problem? And they were like, absolutely not. So Could you imagine like, if they were like, yeah, that is a problem. Right? That's kind of what I thought but they were going to say. I'm yeah. just saying, like, Cheryl, I believe was her name. You dodged That is some bullet. rock solid intuition, man. Yeah. yeah. And I also wanted to say, like, again, part of, like, the whole women feeling like we owe things, like, mm-hmm. Thank God she had the boundaries to be like, I don't want to do this. I'm not going to go. I don't didn't. know if I would. I mean, I didn't meet the guy. I don't know how creepy he was, but I would be like, okay, they spent all this time putting me on a game show and I had to pick right. the guy and I did. Yeah. I have to go out with him. Right. Yeah. And that's, I would yeah. feel really guilty about it. About not doing Which it. Which is and terrible. They had, won, like, yeah. they had won like tennis lessons and like a full tennis outfit and they were going to be trained by like Olympic level, I don't know, tennis Tennis is. Um, anyway and and then like they were going to be sent to like a theme park for the rest of the day and she was just yeah like like, I would feel an obligation 
Absolutely. Yeah. So God bless her that she didn't. Yeah. Good girl. Listen to your gut. Yes. Yeah. So Alcala had said on the dating game that he was a professional photographer, but in actuality, in 1978, he was working for a time as a typesetter for the Los Angeles Times. So back when they used to like print the paper, the type typesetters would have like the fonts and letters that they would like put out, and then you'd run it over. Oh. That's like how they would print the papers. Oh. He used to bring his portfolio to work and like show his coworkers these pictures that he had taken. And one of the coworkers recalled that like she thought that it was weird that he was like bringing these and showing these, but she was like I was young and I didn't really like know at the time that that should be alarming. So she said, when I asked him why he took the photos, he said that their moms asked him to. I remember that the girls were naked. Nope, 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 nope. Another woman came forward who had allowed Alcala to photograph her, and she just said, you know, he said he was a professional, so in my mind, I was just being a model. Ew. She said that his portfolio contained spread after spread of naked teenage boys, oh, most of which were what the fuck, bro. most of which were sexually explicit. Holy hell! Mm-hmm. Uh, carrying around child porn, no big deal. Yeah, no big deal. So just night- carry it around in your back fucking pocket. You want to see my child porn? Like, yeah, what? I mean, pretty much. I mean, I will say I have seen some of the photographs, and like he was a pro- he was a professionally trained photographer. I mean, he had gone to UCLA for that program. He had gone to NYU film school. I mean, yeah. he did have some talent in what he was doing, and having the education behind him really emphasized the ruse of going out and being like, I'm a professional photographer. Uh-huh. Um, but in 1979, um, Alcala had moved in with his mother. He had his own entrance into her house and he wasn't having to pay any rent. He was sending um, his nude pictures to New York for use in pornography magazines and was getting paid for them. So some oh. of these poor people, I'm sure, had no idea that he was selling their nude photographs to porn magazines. Now that I see a picture of him, he absolutely looks like Weird Al Yankovic. Oh my god, what? Um, a little bit. Like if Weird Al and Richard Ramirez had a baby. Oh yeah. Tell totally. me he doesn't look like him. And this was another thing about Alcala is that, you know, a lot of the pictures and things we see of him as this like long, dark, curly hair. But there were also times like I think when he was working at that art school, he had cut off all of his hair. He looked completely I think it's different. The old, it's like it's like the recent the photos. To oh, with me. the long curly, the long hair. curly yeah. like whitish hair. Yeah. He looks like weird out to me. He looks like Nana when she just lets her hair down. <laughs> so and gets her reading glasses on. Reading glasses. <laughs> so on June twentieth, nineteen seventy nine, Alcala leaves his mother's home and he heads to Sunset Beach. There he meets 17-year-old Lori Wirtz, who's, you know, riding around on her roller skates. Mm -hmm. He gives her the usual, I'm a photographer spiel, and he asks her, like, hey, can you just, like, roll or skate towards me and I'll take your picture? And she agreed, and, you know, so he's taking these pictures, and then he tried to get her to, like, leave her friend, get in the car with him, and she was, like, not biting. Nope. Nope. Uh Uh-uh. So... Alcala eventually leaves and gives up, and Lori sees him heading towards Huntington Beach, California. Mm-hmm. This is crucial because later Alcala would try to claim that he wasn't even in the area, and this proved that he was. And they had the pictures of Lori, so they could prove that he was there. It's not hard um, to get, it, to get no. there. No. <laughs> it all blends together. Right. So here's trigger number two. Um, at the same time... Well, I guess all of the murders are technically a trigger, but yeah, this is another child. So um, at the same time, 12-year-old Robin Samso and her friend Bridget had gone to the beach before Robin had a ballet class later that afternoon. She had taken a job answering phones at the ballet studio in exchange for her lessons, and she was supposed to be there by four. Um, but the girls were like, let's go to the beach beforehand. So they were there, they were having a good time. And then all of a sudden, this man appears, says he's a photographer, asked if he could take their picture. So Robin pops up and she's like this happy, bubbly little 12 year old. And she's like, sure. And her friend Bridget's like, uh, no, like, I'm not liking this. 
And as he was trying to convince them, he sort of was like edging Bridget out because she didn't, you know, and then he like She was put, vibe. She was she, yeah. she was feeling she the was bad feeling vibe. the bad vibes. And, and he he's put like, his hand on Robin's leg and she was like, Oh fuck no. Oh. And I mean Bridget was like, Oh fuck no. Yeah. And right at that time, one of um Robin's and Bridget's neighbors, like mom, like the mom of, you know, she's a neighbor, but she's the mom comes around and she's like um what's going on here are you girls like okay what's up and Bridget says that the man like put his head down and immediately like if smoke could have come off his shoes like he was gone out so the girls leave the beach they go back to Bridget's house and um Robin was worried about being late so Bridget was like you know what take my bike just go straight there and don't stop so she was supposed to be there at four. At five o'clock, Bridget's phone rang, and it was one of Robin's brothers asking if she was still there because she had never made it to Damn the ballet it. studio. Mm. By six o'clock, Robin's mom had called to report her missing. Bridget knew with every fiber of her being that if Robin was gone, it was that man mm-hmm. at the beach. And mm-hmm. so they sit her down and with a police sketch artist and, I mean... She had a very accurate police. It was a very accurate script. Very accurate sketch. That is such a cool job to me that people right. have that as I a mean, job. I mean, yeah. it looked. I mean, it looks just like him. Robin's decomposed body was found twelve days later in the L.A. foothills. When her mother heard that her daughter had been found or had possibly been found, she wanted to see her. The detective said they couldn't let her see her because after three days, they still hadn't been able to, like, positively identify Robin. She couldn't understand. And she was like, how many 12-year-old blonde-haired little girls have gone missing? And then the detective had to tell her, like, this body has no hair. There was no body full stop. Out in the elements for almost two weeks, the only thing that they were able to recover of Robin's body was her bones. Damn. Shit, man. Um, Alcala's former parole officer, and I don't know if this is the one that let him go or the one before that, but saw the sketch and immediately turned him in. Probably um, wasn't the one that let him go to New York. That guy was obviously a dunce. Right. Yeah. Um, Alcala was arrested at his mother's house on July 24th, 1979, just four days before yours truly entered the world. <laughs> Oh my God. Um, and he was held without bail. It was funny because I, you know, I mean, it was his arrest was so close to my birthday. I'm like, man, my mom was like in her last days of pregnancy. And I was like, hey, do you remember this? And she was like, oh, kind of. And then the other day she called me and she's like, I looked that guy up. He was sick. I'm like, yeah, <sighs> mom. During a search of Alcala's mother's house, police found a receipt to a storage unit in Seattle, Washington. Oh. Um, the warrant that they had, though, didn't cover paperwork, so they couldn't take the receipt. But because the receipt was out, it was in plain sight, and so they were able to write down all the information from the receipt. Um, also, one of his sisters had gone to see him in prison, and not realizing that they were being recorded, Alcala referenced and said something like, oh, it's a good thing they don't know about the storage unit. <laughs> good one. Oh, so in the so storage stupid. unit... They found his, quote unquote, portfolio, which was thousands of pictures of men, Ew. women, boys, girls, no. varying states of undress. Like, no. The same, you know, the same portfolio, just in a larger scale. Um, they also found quite a bit of jewelry. Ew. And like trophies. He, yeah, absolutely. 100 percent trophies. He tried to claim that it was his, but... Um, pictures of the jewelry were shown to Robin's mother and she identified one as a pair that like Robin had borrowed and was wearing that day. Mm. In 1980, he was tried for the murder of Robin Samso. During the trial, Robin's mother actually brought a gun to court in her purse. <gasps> and it was the early 80s. They didn't so have post scanners. They, they metal didn't detectors. have metal detectors or if they did, they didn't use them. Um, and so she was able to go right into the courtroom with her gun in her purse. So Robin was like the baby of the family and this devastated her. I mean, like absolutely just devastated her. And so she went in there and was going to like avenge her daughter. And her other daughter had said, like, she just kept saying everything's going to be OK. Everything's going to be OK. Oh. So at one point. 
her mother, Robin's mother, puts her hand in the purse to go get the gun. And I saw an interview where she said that all of a sudden she could smell Robin shampoo. <gasps> and oh, I just she got felt like Robin's hand on her hand. And then in the 2020 um, video, her daughter, her other daughter recalls her saying that she heard Robin tell her no. Like, don't do this. So she took her hand from her purse and she didn't do it. So it took less than five hours uh-huh. for the jury to convict, I'll call it, yeah, and sentence him to death. God. Holy hell. The story could have ended here. God damn it. I knew it. For fuck's sake. Yeah. We're going to pause for a moment to bring you this ad. Beep bop ba doop bop. <laughs> Beep bop ba doop bop. There we go. And now. Back we're to back. the and show. Back. Okay. Hi, guys. So, where Hi we guys. left off was that. This motherfucker. The motherfucker had been convicted and sentenced to death. Could have fucking ended here. Could have ended there. But. In 19, or the 1980 conviction was overturned when the California State Supreme Court ruled that the jury in the first trial had been improperly informed of Alcala's previous sex crimes, a.k.a. more prejudicial than probative. Ooh. So in 1986, a second trial commenced, this time without his previous sex crimes being entered, and it made no difference. Alcala was once again convicted and sentenced to death. Well, the yeah. story could have ended there. God but, damn no. it. A Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the conviction should be overturned for ineffective counsel, meaning that Alcala's lawyers hadn't done We're everything that they could have. Or whatever. Yeah. Um, I did read one where, one where, I did read one place that um, the, the thing that kind of allowed this was that Alcala claimed he should have been allowed to present a witness to to support his claim that the park ranger who found Robin's body had been, quote, hypnotized by police. I have to sneeze. Wait. (laughs) (laughs) What is happening? So many bodily functions are going on right now. (laughs) Bang, like, banged out. It fucking banged. I don't know what's happening. I apologize. What is happening? You delete all of that in. This is the old women podcast. (laughs) Where we have Metamucil (laughs) right along next to our Mucinex. You don't want to mix those up like I No. (laughs) Keeping your regular. (laughs) Keeping things flowing. Both keep things flowing. So Alcala uh, was once again um, getting a new trial. So, you know, and I just kept thinking through all of this research, like, what did that do to Robin's family? It was like every time they thought that, like, like how annoyed are we in a one hour story here talking about this? And And this is over a span of, you know, years. I mean, this was 2001, I think, that the Ninth Circuit ruled that. So, and he had been in prison since 1974. Um, it's just you know, like the ripping off the band aid over, you know, just and over, over and over, and over. again. And, and I mean, like every single time, it's is you know he has the possibility of getting out. Yeah. Um, and I just thought that this was like amazing because you look at other cases like Rodney Reed. So he's one that I really want to cover. Um, where you know there has been preponderance of evidence that the woman that he's accused of killing and what he's on death row for he didn't do like Mm -hmm. dna evidence and they have been fighting for years and i think he was like just in the last month granted a new trial like a new trial date looks like west memphis yeah exactly but i mean they had to do they refused to acknowledge that they fucked up right yeah and those guys those poor kids who are men now i mean they had to take an alford plea yeah Yeah. to get out um of it you know to get out of prison and i mean i don't blame them for doing it but it's just crazy um anyway yeah so it's like it's taken years and protests and signatures and everything for rodney reed to get a new trial but they're just like throwing him out left and right for alcala um, That's how it always happens. And then, so Matt Murphy, who is an ABC correspondent, um, who you guys would all know I was if you say saw, if I saw his face. He, he reminds me of the guy 
um, that was on Law and Order that replaced Jack McCoy. That's right. He's like a lawyer. He is a lawyer. That's so right. at the time of the third trial, he was senior district attorney in oh, California. Hell. So he, along with um, Dinah Saturino, who is a deputy district attorney, um, they served as co-counsel. Um, so hold on. I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> All right. So in 2003, while prepping for the third trial, investigators found that DNA, because now we have DNA, yeah, yeah. Um, match semen left at the rape and murder of two women in L.A., and in 2004, four more DNA matches wow. were tied Holy to Alcala. So Matt Murphy was the one who was like, hey, we have all of this evidence. Like, we have this bag of jewelry. So he was the one that had the DNA tested and then linked these four other cases. Oh, my God. Go you, Matt Murphy. I know. Go yeah. ahead. I know. It's just like like holy shit yeah so he was the one that had that that tested damn um so following four murders were linked jill barkham was an adventurous free-spirited 19 year old that decided she wanted to take a trip and she and a friend headed to la from new york no god she was found down the street from marlon brando's home off franklin cannon road she was found bent over half naked head facing in the dirt, multiple ligatures on her neck, and her face was unrecognizable. <sighs> her brother said that at the funeral, he didn't even recognize her. Mm. Initially, she was thought to be a victim of the Hillside Strangler. Oh, fuck, dude. Complicating matters was that a friend of Jill's, who she had made in L.A., actually was kidnapped and murdered by the Hillside Stranglers. Oh, my God. But Jill Barkham, that was one of the, who was like, guys, there are like weird bombshells in this case. And I think I forgot to mention this, but when Alcala was working as the typesetter, which is a job that he got applying with his own name. This is the Los Angeles Times. He got the job by applying with his own name and two felony convictions on his record and was still hired. And while he was there, he was interviewed by police. But he, as a roundup of local sex offenders, was questioned because they thought he might be the Hillside Strangler. Which ended up being Stranglers, but at the time, they didn't know it was two people. So police had actually interviewed him. As the hillside, like, as a potential hillside strangler suspect, but they couldn't tie him to any of the hillside strangler cases, and so he was let go. Wow. Is that not crazy? Wow. I can't believe I almost forgot to mention that. Fuck, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, So, Jill was initially thought to be a victim of the hillside strangler. Um, but it would take until Alcala's third trial to connect her wow. to Alcala. And so, like, this was in the 70s. She was found. So it's not until 2003, 2004, that DNA linked Alcala to her case. It was it was a cold case until then. Wow. Um, Georgia Wickstead was 27. She's a beautiful young woman who worked as a cardiac nurse. She was from L.A., but she had recently moved to Malibu, and she carpooled with a fellow nurse to work. So one day when she didn't show up to pick up the other nurse, um, police were called to do a welfare welfare check. When they arrived, police found a window open, and when they entered, there was blood everywhere, Mm. and they found Georgia completely naked with her body posed and, like, all of these women, like, she was propped up to, like, make her breasts, like, damn it, protrude forward. Um, and uh, police had found a handprint, like, a full bloody handprint on the brass bedding, but they didn't have anybody to compare it to. Um, her cause of death was, and she had also been raped and strangled, but her cause of death was that she had been bludgeoned to death with a hammer in her Malibu apartment in 1977. Charlotte Lamb was 31 and this like I'll have pictures of all of these women but 
Charlotte Lamb Charlotte like Lee. looked like a movie star to me. Like mm. she's just, I mean, all of these women were stunningly beautiful. Um, she was a legal secretary uh, in Santa Monica. And one night in 1978, she had called her friends to go out dancing in Santa Monica, but none of her friends wanted to go. Um, she was found <gasps> raped and strangled in the laundry room of the El Segundo apartment complex building, a building of which she had no connection with and was quite a ways away from her, like from Santa Monica. She too was found posed with her arms behind her back, which made her back arch to expose her breasts. A pair of earrings found in Alcala's storage locker um, were confirmed to be Charlotte's. Wow. Uh, Jill Parentau, 21, was a college student and data entry clerk. She lived alone in her own apartment. Um, on June 13th, she had gone to a Dodgers game. When she didn't show up for work the next day, police went out to check on her. And she was found naked next to the bed on the floor, like just like Charlotte Lamb. And had been posed using a pillow, which propped her breasts up. So all of these women had been strangled and then posed. Um, evidence indicated that, like, really in all of these cases, that Alcala would strangle his victim until they passed out, wait for them to wake up, and then just kept doing it. Just kept strangling them until they died. Because uh, he's a sick fuck. Um, and Gross. then... And then he would pose them in these, like, carefully constructed sexual provocative positions. After they received the evidence of these um, four other women, prosecutors made a motion to join the murder charges so that all the newly discovered victims would be added to the Samso case, meaning that they'd all, he'd be tried for all five at the same time. Good. This is kind of like a kind of an odd request. Normally they wouldn't do that. Yeah. But. Fuck this guy. guy. Listen to this. This is the thing that I thought was hysterical. So um, Alcala's attorney fought this, stating, if you're a juror and you hear one murder case, you might be able to have reasonable doubt. But it's very hard to say you have reasonable doubt on all five, especially when four of the five aren't alleged by witnesses but are proven, proven by DNA. Well, yeah, it's hard to defend a man when there's overwhelming proof and acknowledged by his own attorney, like, that he's guilty. Like, yeah. I get what the attorney saying, like, that puts it puts him in a difficult position, but, like, just have your client plead guilty then because then it's, it's literally proven yeah. that he committed these murders. Mm -hmm. um, in 2006, the California Su Supreme Court ruled that the indictments could be joined and in February of 2010, he stood trial for all five murders. He elected to serve as his own attorney, a la Ted Bundy, and frankly, it didn't work out any better for him than it did for Daryl Ted. Never works um, out. He did, disgustingly, have the opportunity to cross-examine Robin's mother. God damn it. And God bless her for bearing that. Like, he had asked Seriously, her- Seriously, if there was a time she was going to fucking shoot him in the face, it would have been that oh, one. Right. And like- he, you know, he specifically was like, you know, tried to like cast her in a bad light by telling the story. Like, isn't it true that you brought in this gun to shoot me? And he's like, why didn't you? And then she told the story about, you know, feeling she Robin. Felt. And Matt Murphy was like, you know, he thought like he was going to be doing this thing to make her look bad. But all the jury saw was like this man that murdered her daughter is now cross examined. I can't her. imagine sitting there and being cross examined by someone who killed anybody right yeah but let alone your own child your own child I and her daughter in the 2020 episode talks about like you know that it was so hard to watch their mother being cross-examined by him she's like i think we all just sat there and sobbed like, oh my god it would just like destroy a part of you oh, like, like yeah the yeah. svu whole member when she's like benson is kidnapped and raped oh and yes that guy like does the same Did you thing. know? Because so that guy played porn stash. Porn, yes. On um, Orange is the New Black. Yes. On Orange is the New Black, the guy that that storyline, and um, he is Leah Shriver's half brother. Oh my god! Oh. That makes so much sense with their faces. Oh my god! Yeah. Oh my god! Oh my god! I do love Leah. Shriver. God. Um, god. So the other <laughs> thing, though, um, about the trial. Is that he also cross examined himself? Oh God bless fuck so tits. He, Are you God bless fuck tits. He would ask. He would ask himself questions, 
referring to himself as Mr. Alcala in a deeper voice than normal. Oh my god! I and then sh- answering himself, Mr. Alcala, he would be this? like, Mr. I think there is a YouTube on him. Oh, I would. Like, I I want to see himself. this. Um, that insanity went on for five hours. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> Why did you th- what? <laughs> Um, so Alcala claimed that he had been at Knott's Berry Farm applying for a job as a photographer when Robin disappeared. Um, he played a portion of his dating game appearance in an attempt to claim that the earrings found in his storage locker were his. Um, Jed Mills, that actor and fellow contestant on the dating game, told a reporter that at the time it wasn't socially acceptable for men to wear earrings and that he would have definitely remembered if Alcala had been wearing earrings in the taping of the show. Um, Alcala made no real attempt to address the other murders. Like he addressed the Sam So case, but the other four, he, he didn't. He didn't attempt to address them other than to say, like, I don't remember doing it. Did he like stand there and then say, ask the question, and, and then, then run by? No, I think he was answer. just. I think he was just in the chair the whole time. He has a clip on tie that, like, when he's the lawyer, he he like <laughs> he sits it on, and then he just takes yeah. it off to go sit in his chair. Um. Yeah. So as part of his closing argument to himself, this oh, nutcase no. plays oh, the song Alice's Restaurant by Arlo Guthrie, in which the character of the song tells a psychiatrist that he wants to kill. Like, he literally played the whole song as part of his closing argument. He <laughs> Like, and here's the thing. The jury's like, what, what is, what is, this? is happening? I, the thing is, like, Alcala does have a very high IQ. He's mm. very much... I mean, very similar to Ted Bundy in that, like, he could be charismatic and and charming. He could be manipulative. He was incredibly smart. And he thought that that intelligence made him smarter and better than everybody in the room. And um, didn't work out that way. So it took the jury less than two days to convict Alcala on all all five murder charges. Oh. Because they had to go through. I mean, I think it would have been shorter, but they had to go through each one. Yeah. Um, a surprise witness, oh. Oh. Alcala's first known victim, Tally Shapiro, testified during the oh. sentencing phase. Oh, fuck, dude. And in March of 2010, it took the jury less than two hours to oh. affix the death penalty. Wow. Damn. Um, the same month, police in Huntington Beach, California, and the NYPD released 120 of Alcala's photographs asking for the public's help in identifying people as they believed that there are oh, still many more victims. Oh, yeah. When I looked them up, there's just, like, yeah. pictures of kids from here up. It said there yeah. was something posted in 2020 that said, have you seen any of these people? Yes. They're and like, we will or link. 2021. Yeah. I mean. It was, so, yeah, because this... They're this still actively trying to figure Alcala out who Alcala he... episode is this, I think, this season's current yeah. um, season. And so, yes, yeah, so 120 of Alcala's photographs asking for the public's health, health, help, um, approximately 900 additional photos could not be released as they were deemed too sexually explicit. 900? Nine, approximately and how, 900. How many they were released? 120. Within a few weeks, 21 women had come forward to identify themselves, and at least six families had recognized family members that had been missing and never been found. Um, After the conviction um, of the third trial in 2012, Alcala was sent to New York regarding the murders of Ellen Hover and Cornelia Crilly in 1971 and 1975, respectively. Shocking everyone, Alcala just pled guilty to those murders. Wow. And in 2013, he received a sentence of 25 to life for each, which was the maximum penalty allowed by law. And investigators were shocked, but then they also were just like, you know, he probably knew that he was going to be convicted. So. So in 2013, Christine Thornton, who had been missing for almost 40 years and listed as a Jane Doe in Wyoming was identified through these photos when her nephew, who she'd never met. (gasps) So the nephew like knew that he had an aunt that he'd never met and that had, had gone missing, but he had like heard the story and he'd found this link. So he sends the link to his mom, which was her, which was Christine's sister. sister, um, And suggested that Kathy look through the photos and so she did. Um, Chris, as known to her friends and family, was described as a free spirit with long brown hair, 
She's, again, stunningly beautiful. And in 1977 is when she had gone missing. She was 27 years old um, and was pregnant. And she and her boyfriend had decided to leave San Antonio and relocate to Montana because they were going to pan for gold. Oh, no. <laughs> However, I've done that. Have you guys ever done that? Pan for gold? Yes. No. Oh. Well. I mean, I think it would be fun, but I don't know that I would make the life choice to relocate it. my I was life. Just like, I loved it. Um, We did it at a, uh, what is it called? A field trip where we had to go. And there were like pilgrims and they made like this delicious blueberry cobbler. I panned for gold though. I probably still have some somewhere. Nope. Never been panning for gold. Our, where I grew up, our like school, like outside field trip was to go to Penn's Cave, which is a cave and you would go down in a little boat. And yeah. Penn's Cave is a cave. Penn's Cave is a cave. Wow. And it's in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Penn's Cave. Wow. Anyway, um, so Chris at this point and her boyfriend have left San Antonio, heading to Montana um, to make this their new job. However, somewhere in Wyoming, she and her boyfriend had a fight and he left her pregnant and alone. Oh, and wow. You were okay. a son of a bitch. Okay. Now, Christine's mother... <laughs> had reported her missing early on but police were like she's an adult yeah and i really yeah. feel like we need to have a better system have a guess. better system because so much time is wasted and they're like well they're an adult they're allowed to disappear if they want to but it's like i i don't know i just i feel like we had we need to do something better yeah. anyway well, especially if they're pregnant, too. Like, oh, my God. Right. Yeah. Like and it's like most people don't want to just disappear. I, I don't know. Anyway, initially, the family suspected the boyfriend, but he was cleared. And they really had just split up in split ways um, in Wyoming. I bet he feels bad now. Yeah, I bet he does. What do you like? Leave her on the side of the road? So Kathy's remains along with the remains of her unborn child, oh. were discovered on a dirt road in Wyoming by a rancher who reported them to the police in April of 1982. So she went missing in 77. She's not found until 82. Um, clothing and jewelry were, like, found around the body. They were still intact. But with the decomp decomposition of the body, there were only bones. There was no ID on her found near her so the police had no idea who she was right or yeah. how she died now they suspected strangulation because one of her pant legs like because they found her clothing one of her pant legs had been tied into a ligature mm. she remained unidentified for over 30 years that's wild in 2013 detective jeff shaman had was assigned the cold case um and he said when he got the box, it was like it was so old, it was basically falling apart. But in it, he found that there were still bone fragments and skin samples in this box after all that time. And he was like, "Bitch, if you have DNA, you run it." Yeah. yeah. So he entered her DNA into CODIS, which I did not know stood Ooh. for Combined DNA Index System, which was created wow. in 1998. DNA is entered into this national database. And so police can use it both to identify victims and identify perpetrators. Um, but he was told, like, okay, it's been submitted. But they need it's just it's a waiting game because they don't right. have anything to compare. They need it something to. to compare it to, right. right? So meanwhile, while all that's happening, Kathy's scrolling through the hundred plus photos and she stops on one. Like she keeps coming back to this one of a woman on a motorcycle in the desert that she's like. Man, that looks like Chris. Now, Chris had an unusual physical feature in that on her foot, her pinky toe is kind of like raised and sort of overlaps the toe oh, next to it. Yeah. So luckily, the woman on the motorcycle is wearing flip flops and she kind of like zoomed in and she's like, oh, my God, that's Chris. So back in 1977, when that parole officer let Alcala go to New York, he didn't fly. He drove. And so he's driving back from New York, through... <gasps> driving across the nation. Oh. So the motorcycle that Chris is sitting on in that photograph is Alcala's motorcycle. Oh, God. And police were able to confirm it was his motorcycle. So somehow on this trip where he had murdered, you know, two yeah. women, you know, in, or had murdered Ellen Hover in New York, and he 
had crossed paths with Chris at some point. Wow. Um, so investigators go to question Alcala. It had been six years since his third conviction. Um, by this time, he was 73. He was in ill health and was confi- confined, confined to a bed in a hospital wing. One of the investigators just described that it looked like a horror movie. Like it was that peachy pink mental institution oh. color with like paint peeling from the walls and flies buzzing around the room. Just oh, no. gross and disturbing. Now, <gasps> this is so gross. So they question Alcala about Christine. And while he denied killing her, they had like, they were showing him this picture of her and they were like, okay. You know, do you remember her? And he's like, yes. And they're like, okay, did you, you know, did you kill her? And he's like, no, man, you're crazy. But while they were sitting there watching him, he started like outlining her body on the photo with his hand, like his finger. And they kept like tapping it. And they were talking about watching his eyes like (gasps) flutter. So he was like. Even he though he was reliving it, it. He, he was full rel- on, full on oh. reliving it. Get and like they were all of these investigators were oh. like, it just gave them like, you just know. Away. You know he yeah. freaking oh he probably had a jerked off. off. So uh, I'll call it while he denied killing Christine, he couldn't deny the photograph. And <laughs> while he would not admit to killing her, they got him to admit both that he knew her that he had taken this photo, that he was with her, and that was really all that they needed. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, he's already serving a yeah. well, yeah. life and so sentences. They just that needed was, to admit it. At this that point. was the other thing. Like, So Kathy submitted her DNA to the FBI, and it came back as a match to Christine. So now Christine finally had her name back um, that um, Shaman, the detective Shaman, was just like, you know, he thought he was going to be like, old and retired before anything if anything ever came back and now it's like holy crap like already three, yeah. you know they know so christine had her name back finally um alcala was charged with christine's death in 2016 however due to the ill health and the fact that he was confined to a bed moving alcala and getting him to trial was going to be no easy or no so and, and no cheap task so yeah. In the end, they kind of all talked about it, and they were like, he's literally rotting in that yeah. bed. Like, he's exactly where he needs to be. Um, So they, you know, so they chose not to not to prosecute and or to take him to trial. And, I don't, you know, it wasn't easy for the family to learn that he wouldn't be prosecuted. And I think they understand. I understand why they chose not to do it. But I think, and I do understand the financial burden that it puts on the system to financial try and that resources are already, that are like just yeah all i mean the... yeah the, it, there are limited finite resources um and unfortunately there are plenty of people to prosecute but there's a car alarm in the background yeah if you hear it, i was sorry. like what is that noise but at the same time i feel like it robs something from the victims families yeah to not get that closure of having them actually convicted and with alcala i mean they investigators and like there was a woman that was interviewed where she spent 18 hours interviewing him. She was like on the panel of Wix, Wix experts, experts at Wix-Berts. his third trial. And I mean, he's he's 100 percent, you know, a sociopath, psychopath. And um, but like that was his power was to not, you know, not admit to some of these cases Um and to take that to his grave with yep. him. I don't know. Anyway, uh, in 2019, California Governor Newsom put a moratorium on the death penalty, effectively giving all of those on death row a stay of execution. Robin's mom wanted nothing more than to live long enough to see him executed. Unfortunately, she passed away July 23rd, 2019. Rodney Alcala died of natural causes on July 24th, 2021, 42 years to the day of his, his his initial arrest because he was arrested on July 24th, 1979. And, you know, then I was like, Robin's mom passed away a year, no, two years, two years. and a day before he died. Um, oh, so cool. the last thing that I will say, and I think that this ended the story perfectly, 
Robin Samso's sister said on Facebook the day that the, new, the news of Alcala's death broke that it was the best birthday present for her mom. Mm. And she said, quote, today we received the best news ever. Alcala died. I know my mom is dancing up in heaven. He can't appeal this one. <laughs> my sister can finally rest in heaven literally now. Mm. And so that is the story of Rodney Alcala, the dating game killer. And I'm glad he's dead. That was terrible. It yeah. just, you know, again, we talked about hindsight being 2020, but like so many times. I don't understand. He could have so been stopped. Kill- serial killers like this. This happens all the time with them. It really does. It's just. It blows my mind. I know. It's crazy. It's absolutely like, what? What? Mm-hmm. But that's it. Remember who you are. What you represent, and don't get into cars with strangers. And Fuck being polite. Stay Fuck. Be rude, stay alive. Right? Be rude, stay alive. If that's not the quote, it's ours now. So it is the quote, so we don't get it. Oh, Thanks, yeah. crime junkie. But we like you, crime. We have to think of something. Have a safe word. Have a safe word have in safe. the bedroom and on the streets. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> um. And yeah, and that's that's the story for today. So. We love you guys. Thank you for listening. Okay. See you next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. We put out new episodes every single Wednesday. And if you're impatient like me, be sure to become a Patreon where you can get your episodes early each week. For as little as $2 a month, you not only significantly support the production of this podcast, but you'll also get ad-free episodes in addition to them being early. Go to patreon.com slash threes a crime podcast. For pictures, videos, and links related to this episode, be sure to check out our Instagram at threes a crime. And for more information, go to threesacrime.com. <laughs>